Welcome to Global India, a cultural fusion podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lily Padman. We have as our guest an outstanding young lady, a millennial who has been tapped to address today's topic, Global Outlook, from a millennial's perspective. I am delighted to introduce Manisha Tarachand, who has just graduated cum laude from Miami University with a degree in international relations. Thank you, Manisha, for joining us on this podcast and sharing your perspective on the global outlook for the foreseeable future. Can you tell us a little bit about your background, education, and work? Sure. I am of Indian descent from Fremont, California. At the age of 12, I moved to Bangalore, India from California, where I completed my middle school and high school education at the Indus International School. After finishing my high school education in India, I was accepted at Miami University, which is located in Oxford, Ohio. For my undergraduate education, I majored in international relations and double minored in Spanish and Latin American studies. During my time at Miami University, I was a College of Arts and Science student ambassador. I was a peer mentor for incoming freshman students from China, and I was a cultural student ambassador for the 2019 SUSE program, which is a study of the U.S. institutes. During my time at Miami U, I also worked for two summers during 2018 and 2019 with Dell and my campus bookstore as a Dell campus rep, and I held a part-time job from 2018 and 2020 working at my school's Office of Undergraduate Research as a student assistant, where I and other fellow coworkers organize the annual undergraduate research forum. Currently, I have accepted a job with Dell to be an account manager where I'm managing over 40 universities across the U.S. and maintaining the relationship between them and the university. You clearly epitomize the fusion of cultures at its best. Can you tell us if and how your education in India has influenced you in some ways? India has influenced my education in the sense that it has humbled me tremendously. My school was a grandiose building that looked very similar to the White House, but right outside my school gates, there were people who lived in shacks and huts and walked around on their bare feet. It made me very thankful to my parents for being able to send me to such a beautiful school, but it also made me want to do more for the community that surrounded me. At Indus, we had to do community service from 9th to 12th grade, and during these community service events, we went to local village schools and help them clean up the school grounds and play with the children. I had never seen such poverty before until I started living in India. I would not have received this type of awakening if I had remained in school in Fremont. Therefore, I took this experience to my university and enrolled in a major where I could focus on getting a job in public policy and making systemic changes to decrease such wealth inequality. Having graduated cum laude from a major U.S. university, and having successfully landed an exciting position at Dell Corporation, what are your future aspirations? What is your general outlook on the future of our planet? As a millennial, most of our predecessors believe we do not think much about our future, about aging, retirement, and what financial state we'll be in before we die. In my personal experience, I have realized in our world, nothing is certain except taxes and death, which the COVID-19 pandemic has proven true. We grew up with the 9-11, the first African-American president to be elected, the digital media era, the Great Recession, the Gulf War, many school shootings in the United States, and our environment degradation right before our eyes at a rapid pace. Based on what I have lived through as a millennial, my view might paint a less than idealistic picture about the future of our global politics and economics. Blame it on growing up during the Great Recession and with the threat of terrorism, but I personally am not too optimistic about achieving world peace or financial stability in my lifetime. 
I believe our generation will live through another major economic depression, and we might even experience World War III. But that idea has died down a little since Trump is out of office. Whew. I am a bit surprised by the generally pessimistic tone of your response, but I'm glad to see the pessimism being toned down by an optimistic note anticipating the end of the Trump era. How do you foresee the new administration and the new generation handling the global issues in the coming years? Well, I apologize. I never intend to be pessimistic, but learning what I have learned in my major, I have to take into consideration all the negatives that are in our world as well. In my opinion, I believe our generation will experience the biggest shift in our lifestyles due to climate change. Climate change is a huge topic amongst millennials. Thanks to living in the digital media era, social media has forced Starbucks and many other restaurants and businesses to become more sustainable. For example, now Starbucks offers more environmentally friendly menu items. They have pushed away from using single-use plastics and even a greener green apron for the employees. We are bearing the burden from the baby boomers and the industrial era, but we are also enforcing rapid change. There are many ways millennials have changed the world as we know it. Delaying home ownership and marriage due to financial constraints, caused retailers to shift their strategies or downsize due to online shopping, fueled growth in the wellness industry, allowed for many startups to occur at a younger age, and we are pushing for more activism by talking more openly about issues spanning from mental health, income inequality, and social ju injustice. I am proud to call myself a millennial, and I believe the world will become a safer and more equitable world to live in if past generations would just believe in us and give us the reins because we are the generation now to set up the future for our future generations to come. Wow, you are talking about seismic changes in society. Thank you, Manisha, for voicing your opinion so candidly and for thoroughly analyzing the current situation in terms of its impact on the future. Do you see the U.S. playing a key role on the world stage? For instance, do you advocate the idea of the U.S. rejoining the Paris Agreement? I completely advocate for the idea of the U.S. rejoining the Paris Agreement. I think it is a must and that it was foolish that Trump withdrew from it. I believe the world has shown record-breaking support for the Paris Agreement. The adoption of the agreement was preceded by the largest meeting of world leaders in one place. The signing of the agreement saw the most signatures to an international agreement on a single day in history, 175 to be exact, and the agreement was enforced in record time, only 11 months from adoption to signing to ratification and enforcement. The unprecedented support for this agreement and the speed in which it was enforced is a strong sign that the world recognizes that climate change is the greatest and most urgent challenge. Also, the U.S. has been a leader in climate change, and it can't give that up now. The United States is the world's biggest economy and one of the biggest contributors to climate change, but it has also been one of the strongest advocates for climate action. The Paris Agreement is our best hope for addressing the climate crisis. Lastly, to compete and win in the global clean energy economy, the U.S. needs the Paris Agreement. The world is in the midst of a fundamental transition to clean energy, wherein consumers are demanding it, industries we are investing in it, and jobs are surging. But if the U.S. steps away from the Paris Agreement, it will lose momentum in the clean energy race and cede our leadership position and vast vast economic opportunities to our competitors. Thank you, Manisha, for that comprehensive look at meaningful ways to tackle the climate crisis. Moving on to a slightly broader topic, as a student of international relations, what are your views on how the U.S. should manage its international relations going forward? In this context, I'm reminded of a quote from George Washington, which is probably still relevant today. Observe good faith and justice toward all nations. Cultivate peace and harmony with all. In your opinion, should the U.S. continue an isolationist mega policy or 
pursue a more inclusive, collaborative approach toward international relations. It's tempting to draw sweeping conclusions about what geopolitics will look like after the pandemic. Some argue that we're witnessing the last gasp of American primacy, the equivalent of Britain's 1956 Suez moment, while others argue that America, the main driver of the post-Cold War international order, is temporarily incapacitated with a president drunk at the wheel. Tomorrow, a more sober operator can swiftly restore U.S. leadership. There is a lot we don't know yet about the virus or how it will reshape the international landscape. What we do know, however, is that we have drifted into one of those rare periods of transition with American dominance in the rearview mirror and a more anarchical order looming dimly behind. The moment resembles, in both its fragility and its geopolitical and technological dynamism, the era before World War I, which triggered two global military convulsions before statecraft finally caught up with the magnitude of the challenges. To navigate today's complicated transition, the United States will need to move beyond the debate between retrenchment and restoration and imagine a more fundamental reinvention of America's role in the world. I believe the U.S. should continue a more collaborative approach towards international relations because the world is now globalized and we all need one another in many ways. We should not break or hinder our relationships with other countries because we never know when we will need their support. I believe we can go about achieving better international relations by restoring old alliances and reinventing our approach. It is clear that U.S. leaders feared the uncertain, slippery slope of intervention abroad far more than the certain waves of human tragedy that would flow absent American action. It is also evident that leading from behind is an oxymoron and that the U.S. failed to appreciate how much emerging democracies depended on America and how methodically authoritarians would contest the democratic model. Lastly, in regards to reinvention, first and foremost, American foreign policy must support domestic renewal. Smart foreign policy begins at home with a strong democracy, society, and economy, with more and better jobs, greater security, a better environment, and a more inclusive, just, and resilient society. The well-being of the American middle class ought to be the engine that drives our foreign policy. We're long overdue for a historic course correction at home. We need to push for more inclusive economic growth, growth that narrows gaps in income and health. Our actions abroad must further that goal rather than hamper it. Prioritizing the needs of American workers over the profits of corporate America is essential. Leaders must do a far better job of ensuring that trade and investment deals reflect those imperatives. Finally, do you think the new Biden-Harris administration has what it takes to build back America and the world? Yes, I do. Under a Biden-Harris administration, I anticipate more robust conversations and action in a few areas that would affect health and racial health inequities. First, I think the administration is going to shift the narrative of the coronavirus pandemic. They have already begun to do so by announcing and working with their COVID-19 task force. I think this team is going to lay a strong foundation to the promotion of more evidence and science-based practices coupled with social policies that can help support people such as income and housing protections. Relatedly, I think the Biden-Harris administration will reverse executive orders that are harmful to the environment and seriously consider policy actions to address climate change, beginning with rejoining the Paris Agreement and rescinding executive orders that removed environmental protections such as limitations on greenhouse gas emissions. Too many Black and Indigenous communities are at greater risk of being exposed to toxic air and water, so addressing climate change and environmental racism may be a priority in this administration. Overall, I can imagine a Biden-Harris administration promoting a more holistic approach to social and economic conditions, which will have a more positive impact on health. On that positive note, let us start 2021 with renewed hope for humanity. Thank you, Manisha, for your insights and realistic assessment of what's in store for us in 2021 and beyond. A big thank you to our listeners as well. Here is to a happy new year and a fresh start.
Thank you, Lilianti, for inviting me to participate in the Global India podcast. Let us hope for the end of the COVID pandemic and a global economic revival in the new year. We conclude this episode with some nostalgic music and a joke. You're all familiar with the term 2020 vision. If you have been told by your optometrist that you have a 2030 vision, it sounds better than a 2020 vision. But in reality, it means that someone with a normal vision standing 30 feet away from an object has the same view of the object as you do standing only 20 feet away from that object. In other words, if you have a 2030 vision, it means you're short sighted. The other day, I overheard Beverly asking Martha, So, what is your vision for 2021? Pat came the reply, I don't have a 2021 vision. Thanks to Occuvite, an eye vitamin prescribed by my ophthalmologist, I still have a 2020 vision. And now the end is near. And so I face the final curtain. My friends, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case of which I'm certain I've lived a life that's full I've traveled each and every highway and more much more than this I did it my Regrets, I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention. I did what I had to do and saw it through without exemption. I've planned each other course, each careful step along the byway and more, much more than this. I did it my way. Chahe jo tumhe pure dil se milta hai wo mushkil se. Aisa jo koi kahi बस वही सब से हसी है उस हाथ को तुम थाम लो वो मेहर कल हो न हो हर पल यहाँ जी भर जियो जो है समा कल हो Yes, there were times, I'm sure you knew, when I beat off more than I could chew. But through it all, when there was doubt, I ate it up and spit it out. I faced the mall. I've loved, I've 
after I've cried I've had my fill My share of losing And now As tears subside I find it all So amusing To think I ate it all that And may I say Not in a shy way Oh no Oh no not me I did it my way For what is the man What has he got If not himself Blow!